Good morning. It's great to be with you all. If I have not met you yet, my name is John Fanus. I'm the lead pastor here at University Covenant. And again, just want to welcome you and say how grateful we are to be able to worship together and, and be together this morning. Uh, we are continuing our series called Relationships, A Mess Worth Making. Um, relationships, A Mess Worth Making. And, and just as a reminder, we started the series. We're in week three right now. But we started the series looking um, at the book of 1 Corinthians where uh, Paul is writing to the church. And despite all their biblical knowledge, despite all their or the giftedness that God has given them despite all that they were doing, he's looking at them and says that you are spirit, still spiritual babies. You're not quite mature yet. And the indicator, the thing he found is the reason I know this isn't because of how much you know or how passionate you are, but I know you're still growing in, in infants because of the lack of your, the quality of your relationships with one another. In other words, the relationships are broken. And so no matter how great you are in all these other things, if it's not manifesting itself, if it's not playing out in your relationships with one another, then it's not really playing out at all. And so we've been spending this, this season for six weeks talking about relationships, that, that they are a mess, but they're a mess worth making. And so the theme that we've been talking about is this, we'll just keep repeating this, that the indicator of your spiritual maturity with God is the quality of your relationships with one another. That's the mark. That's the indicator. That's the sign. Um, and especially with those who are a little more difficult, and I always say, if you don't know who that is, it might be you, so be humble. Um, <laughs> but it's how what we learn about God, how what we learn in the Bible manifests and plays out in our relationships. It's a sign of our spiritual maturity. So this should just cause us all to have a humble posture towards God uh, wanting to grow. And then last week we talked about facing that gap between reality and expectations and what to do about that. And, and today and next week, these next two weeks, we're going to focus on one topic. And it's the topic of forgiveness. And um, I just want to say I wish I learned about this earlier. But we're going to have a, we're going to have a verse that we're going to uh, look at today and look at next week as well. And I want us to say it out loud together. It's Ephesians 4.32. Let's say this out loud. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Let's say it one more time. Let's do it again. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. In other words, the verse is saying we are to be com compassionate and kind. We're actually to forgive each other. Why? Because Christ, in Christ, God has forgiven you and me. And what I mean by I wish I had learned this earlier. If, if someone, and, and perhaps someone did teach me, I just missed it. But if I had learned about forgiveness when I was younger, I would have saved myself so much grief, so much pain, and so much burden. If someone had just taught this to me, or at least reminded me and learned, helped me how to, how to forgive. On the other hand, if I had learned how to forgive earlier, I think I would have experienced for a good portion of my life so much more joy, so much more freedom, and so much more enjoyment of relationships. See, I don't know what your story is, and I think we just need to be reminded that, that when we give our lives to Jesus, when we accept his forgiveness and actually accept his leadership in our lives, that he is the king, he is the Lord, he's the one driving our lives, when we surrender that direction to him, something amazing happens in the spiritual realm, in the heavenly realm, and in our soul. And just to remind you, that if you have given your life to Christ, if you call yourself a Christian, we just need to remember that when that moment happened, God took everything you did wrong, all your sin, all your guilt, and he took what belonged to you and took it away from you, and God put it on Jesus Christ onto the cross, and Jesus died to take away all your sins so that you are clean. And not only did he take away your sin, the Bible says in Romans that he also gave you Jesus' perfect cleanliness and righteousness onto you. So it's not only that you are removed of your sin, but you have a new identity in Christ and God sees you as pure and righteous and clean so that you can go to God with no shame, with no embarrassment, with full confidence and courage. You can go to God and say, I am free before you, God, because you have done the work that eliminates any blockage, any barrier to my relationship to you. It's called forgiveness. And not only that, God does something even more amazing. Scripture says that he actually adopts you. 
that before you were forgiven by him, you were you are an orphan to him. And he went out of his way and did all the work necessary to bring you into his family so that where before you were just created in his image, you were a creation of God. Now you have a new title. You are a child of God. And you are a son or daughter of his and you belong to his family. So that we can now look at each other if we're believers and call each other brother or sister and really mean it. Not that we just forgot each other's names. We can actually really say that. That we are family together. And because God has adopted you into his family and has made you brothers and sisters with all those who are part of his family, because you now are related to him, you now get his inheritance. And scripture says that his inheritance is everlasting life with him, is a new body, is resurrection after you die. And this is wonderful news. Amen? Can I do a little amen? amen? This is good news. And when I became a Christian, I understood this. I was so elated that I am forgiven. I am free. I have a joyous relationship with God. And everything I've done has been taken on the cross. And now God forgives me and gives me his righteousness. And I love that. But no one ever taught me that now I was supposed to forgive other people as a result. I'm not sure. Maybe they did. I just missed it. I didn't quite catch that in light of everything God had done for me, that now he expected me to forgive those around me. And had I known this, I think the first half of my life would have been so much more joyous and free. And when I discovered this, it changed everything. And we sometimes miss it in Jesus' words. When we pray the Lord's Prayer now and then, one of the phrases, if you remember it, is, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Now, if we actually wanted to translate it literally, this is what it would say. Forgive us our sins as we have already forgiven those who have sinned against us. So when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he says, continue to ask for God's forgiveness in the same way that you've already forgiven everyone who's harmed you. And I think the disciples were a little confused by that. I think they were thinking to themselves, but I don't know if I have forgiven everyone. And Jesus made this assumption. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but the two times in, in the Bible where Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer to his disciples, he follows up the prayer with a specific thing. Because I think the disciples were a little confused by the prayer, especially that line that says, forgive us our sins as we've already forgiven those who have sinned against us. And so Jesus comes back around after he teaches the prayer and says, I know you're hung up on this. And so right after the Lord's Prayer, this is what he says. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But catch this. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I want you to catch this, what Jesus is saying. He's saying, this part of this prayer I'm teaching you is so important. Because your forgiveness, your reception of forgiveness of God is correlated to whether you are able to forgive other people. And sometimes we paint Jesus as this nice, soft gentleman who just says kind things. But when he talks about forgiveness, he's very firm. And he's very clear. That if you and I do not forgive those who have harmed us, then it affects whether God can forgive us. Later on in Matthew chapter 18, Peter, one of his disciples, asked Jesus, so, so Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister? And I think Peter, to, to kind of be a bit arrogant, says, seven times, Jesus? Like, if someone does something to me, the same thing, seven times in a row, if I forgive him seven times, is that good? And Jesus says, no, it's 70 times seven. In other words, you keep forgiving. And then Jesus tells this parable, a story, about a king with a servant. And this servant of the king built up a debt so great that Jesus uses the amount of money that would be equivalent to billions of dollars today. And Jesus says that this servant owed his king billions and billions of dollars and could not repay the king. And he knows the consequence. The king was going to put him in prison for this. And so the servant comes to the king and says, please, King, have mercy on me. Have patience with me. Eventually I'll repay, I promise, which was a silly promise because there was no way a servant can pay back billions and billions of dollars. And in this parable, Jesus says that the king had compassion on his servant and canceled out the whole debt 
and said, you are free. I don't know how many of you have mortgages right now, but can you imagine your bank calling you and says, you know that mortgage? It's done. Forget it. You are free. That kind of elation, that freedom, like what? This is great news. And so as it says, that servant walked away elated, but then he ran into one of his peers who owed him just a few pennies. And his peer said, hey, have patience with me. I, I know I'll be able to pay you back. And this servant said, no way. And he threw his peer into prison until his peer can pay back just a few pennies compared to the billions he was just forgiven for. In this parable, Jesus says that, that the friends of the servant who did this were so aghast, were so troubled by this, that they reported this king to the king. The king, you know that guy you just forgave billions of? He couldn't even forgive his peer for a few pennies and send him to prison. And so it says that the king got angry with the servant and came to him and said, How dare you? How is it that I could forgive you for these billions of dollars and this friend of yours can only, only owes you a few pennies and you said no, you couldn't forgive that? And the parable says that the king threw that servant into prison and tortured him until he could pay back his debt. And you want to feel real heavy. This is what Jesus says after that. Let's go to the next slide. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Whew. This is not a side issue for Jesus. This is so core to what it means to be a Christian. And you may ask, and rightly so, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought that the way God saves us has nothing to do with what we do. It's by grace. It's not by what we do. In fact, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved. It's not of yourself. It's a gift of God. No one can boast. But here it seems like Jesus is saying that, that our forgiveness is conditional upon what we do. How, how does that work? And I believe what God would say and Jesus would say is this. That if you are unable or unwilling to forgive someone who has harmed you, then you have not fully receive the grace of God. Because if you fully understood, if you fully received, and you fully embraced everything that Jesus Christ has done for you, your freedom, your righteousness, your adoption, your inheritance, then it would be very normal and natural to forgive a brother or sister who has harmed you. That those two things are intricately connected. In fact, whenever Jesus speaks of forgiveness, I, I think it's whenever the Bible speaks of forgiveness, it's always connected to what God has done for you. It's not this moral thing you should be, do, but it's a response to what God has done for you. And Jesus is saying, if you are unwilling to forgive a brother or sister, you have not fully received what God has done for you. Because if you have, if you understand the mightiness and the grandioseness of what God has done for you, it will result in wanting to forgive your brother and sister just by comparison. So this is serious business to Jesus. C.S. Lewis, who I seem to quote every sermon now, says this. <laughs> to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable. Because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. It's just what it means to be a Christian. And as people began to talk to me about forgiving other people, uh, I learned so much more about forgiveness and the results of unforgiveness. There are, there are psychological and there are, there are spiritual things that go on when we hold on to resentment. For example... When you hold on to bitterness, when I hold on to bitterness, one of the things we do is we just stew on that person. We rehearse over and over and over again what they've done to us. Is it just me? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Like we go to bed thinking about it, we wake up thinking about it, the whole day we're thinking about what this person did. Uh, uh, uh. And let me just ask, how much is that, is that person thinking of you at that moment? <laughs> Hardly at all. And this is the most unfair thing. They did the wrong, but they're living scot-free but here I am stewing. It doesn't even affect you. Ephesians says that when we hang on to our anger, 
We give Satan a foothold in our lives. I remember when one of my boys was younger and learning to rock climb in one of those rock climbing warehouses. They had one for kids that weren't that high, but, but my son really wanted to climb it. So he started climbing. He got halfway, which is like right here, but he got halfway. And, and he had one hand on one rock, another hand on the other rock, one foot on one rock, but he could not find a, a foothold, a rock for his right foot. And, and I won't scream because I'm wearing a mic, but he was literally screaming, Daddy, Daddy, help me. And so what I did is I took his foot and I put it on a rock. And all of a sudden, he just calmed down. It's like safe, secure. The Bible says that when you hold on to your anger, Satan feels safe, secure, at home. Because you've given him a foothold in your life. Someone said holding on to resentment is like drinking poison, hoping the other person will die. It just doesn't work. When we hold on to resentment, we're actually punishing ourselves. We're doing destruction to ourselves. See, what happens is we're not able to live in the present and enjoy the present because our past is still plaguing us. And so there are, there are spiritual God-ordained obedience reasons to forgive, but we also understand that Jesus loves us and he knows that the effect of unforgiveness hurts us more than anybody else. So here's what we're going to do. And let me just say, as we talk about this, I know that for some of you, um, some hurts are coming up and you feel trapped. And there are relatives, there are family members, there are coworkers, there are neighbors uh, who have caused you harm. And my prayer for today and next week is that God will bring you and I freedom and as a church, we'll learn to forgive. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about what is forgiveness first. What exactly are we talking about when we say forgiveness? Because if we get it wrong, it could mess with what we're doing. And then we're going to talk about how do you know you need to forgive? And this is going to sound cruel, but what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you identify today someone you need to forgive. And then next week we're going to talk about how do we actually forgive? What's the process of forgiveness? So let's first talk about what is forgiveness? Because this is so important. If we don't get this right, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, take some wrong turns. And if, and if we don't understand it, we might, we might minimize what forgiveness actually is. So let's make sure we know what it is and what it isn't. So here's the definition of forgiveness. If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. Forgiveness means letting go of deeply held negative feelings toward a person or a group who has harmed you, and replacing those feelings with compassion for the offender. Say it one more time. Forgiveness is letting go of deeply held negative feelings toward a person or a group. I threw out the word group because sometimes there's a group we feel resentful towards, and it often is connected to a person or persons in that group who have done us harm. So it's both person or a group who has harmed you and replacing those feelings with compassion for the offender. That's what forgiveness is. Now, we need to be clear what forgiveness is not. And this is really important, so I want to, hear, I want to make sure you hear this. One, forgiveness is not saying that the, what the person did to you is no big deal. The power of forgiveness is you're saying, no, what they did to me was a big deal. It was wrong. It was evil. So you're not saying, oh, don't worry about it. Oh, it wasn't a big deal. No, 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 no. Forgiveness is much different. Forgiveness is saying, it was a big deal, and I still choose to let go of the negative feelings and have compassion on you. But please don't hear me say that it's going to minimize the wrong done to you. The power of forgiveness is it faces the wrong done to you with honesty. That's why I think sometimes we need to be careful in our language. When you feel really hurt by someone and that person actually has an aha and says, hey, uh, I'm sorry, and they come to you and say, I'm sorry, sometimes our response is, oh, it was no big deal. When actually that was a lie. <laughs> it was a big deal. I think a better response to those moments is, thank you for saying that. I forgive you. Because that's what forgiveness is. It's saying it was a big deal, but I choose to still forgive. So forgiveness is not condoning or approving or minimizing what was done to you. It's, it's being very honest and real about it. 
Here's the second thing that's really important about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not the same thing as trust. Let me say it again. Forgiveness is not the same thing as trust. Trust takes two people, you and another person. And trust is built over time. Forgiveness is different. Forgiveness does not depend on whether the person ever realizes what they did was wrong or ever apologizes for what they did was wrong. Forgiveness just depends on you and God, irregardless of the other person's behavior. Trust, on the other hand, is different. It does take the other person, and it requires them to rebuild trust to be in a relationship again. And if they have not rebuilt trust, it's often wise and smart and, and intelligent of you not to be back in a relationship with them. In other words, if, they, if this is a situation where they are causing you harm or have caused you harm, and even you have felt violated and betrayed, and there is no change in behavior or no evidence that they're changing, it is not smart for you to enter back into that relationship. You are called to forgive them, but you're not called to trust them until they earn that trust. So please don't come away from this time thinking, well, I need to go back into this abusive relationship. No. Trust takes their work too. And if they don't do their work, it is wise for you to stay away from that person. Now, often that needs to be determined with Christian community asking friends you trust and determining that. But what Jesus is talking about is not trust. He's talking about forgiveness. And forgiveness happens whether or not the person has realized what they did was wrong and whether or not they apologize. Forgiveness is letting go of deeply held negative feelings toward a person or a group and replacing them with compassion for the offender. All right, now we're going to have fun. How do you know you carry resentment? So I told you I'm not trying to be cruel here, but because we really believe that God's word is meant not to just know, but to apply, to actually put into practice, what I want you to do right now, what I want to do is help you identify someone you need to forgive. Woohoo! This is exciting. Uh, And again, this is not out of cruelty. This is more, I really want us to practice this together as a community. So here are some Hints, here's some indicators you can look for to figure out, is there someone I need to forgive? Uh, Here's the first one. Pretend there's someone that you're having a hard time with, and another friend who's uh, now with you, the other person is not, another friend comes and begins to talk about this person. Do you secretly wish they'll begin to say something negative about that person? See, resentment loves company. Amen? (laughs) Like when you're upset with someone, you want the whole world to be upset with them. So one of the signs is when you hear someone talking about that person, if you're thinking, oh, let it come. Come on. Negative. Go negative with me. (laughs) Then that's a sign that God has someone for you to forgive. That's a sign that God has someone for you to forgive. Here's another sign. I mentioned this earlier. Are you stewing over someone? Stewing over something that someone did to you? Is it something you rehearse over and over and over again to the point that it's very hard to be present with someone because the past of what this person has done is harming you? That stewing is a sign that God wants you to forgive someone. Here's another one. Who or what do you feel cynical about? Who or what do you feel cynical about? See, cynicism is a sign that there is someone who has not met an expectation of yours and you're resentful about that. Where are you cynical? And because I'm on a C.S. Lewis rant today, here's another C.S. Lewis one for you. He says, imagine that, I think he says, imagine you pick up a newspaper, which how many of us do that now? But uh, uh, imagine you pick up a newspaper and there's an article about someone And they've been discovered of doing something really wrong and uh, really awful. And then let's say the next day the newspaper comes out and they retract that article and they apologize. They've misprinted information. That person did nothing wrong. Do you feel happy or sad about that? (laughs) See, if you feel sad about that, if you really wished it was true, God's saying you need to forgive that person. Are you minimizing what they've done? Not at all. Are you saying, oh, it was no big deal? Not at all. But what you're saying is that God is calling me to forgive this person. Do you have a person you need to forgive? Just nod at me. All right, cool. 
Now, why am I saying cool? That's awful as your pastor. That's not good. <laughs> cool that we get to apply God's word together. Now, here's the downer. It's going to be next week where we talk about how to forgive that person. <laughs> so what an awful thing to do. But here's what I want us to do today. Every time scripture talks about forgiveness, it's connected to what Jesus has done for you. So to ask you to forgive someone without fully sitting in what God has done for you is awful. So what I want us to do today in this week is just sit and enjoy and remember what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. And so if I can just say again, just as a reminder, that without God initiating with you, your sins would lead you into an eternity away from him and misery here. And Jesus, out of compassion and love for you, you and I, who have turned our backs on him, before we even said, God, I'm sorry, Scripture says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not after we said we were sorry, but while our backs were turned towards God, your God took the initiative, saw your guilt and shame, and said, I will send Jesus Christ down. And I, though there is nothing imploring me to do this on my own, because of my love for you, I will intentionally make it possible to remove every single wrong you have done to others or to God and put it on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And not done in a mean way, but Scripture says, for the joy set before Jesus, he did this for you. All your guilt, all your shame has been taken away. And then to add even more, Jesus says that he has taken his righteousness, his purity, his wonderfulness, and given it to you. And now that is your identity. So that when you go before God and feel guilty, God's going to say, wait, that's not you anymore. You are pure. You are clean. Approach me with confidence. Approach me with joy. It's all been done for you. And we just need to sit and remember this. Amen? And, and, and not only that, I'm going to repeat myself, but it's just so worth remembering that, that God has adopted you into his family. He now says and looks at you and says, you are my child. And we sometimes make a mistake, and I don't mean to be uh, rigid here, but we often call the whole world the children of God. But scripture makes it clear that everyone in the world is in the image of God and worthy to God. But it's those who God who's adopted who become his children. So it's those who've been adopted where we can say, God, you are my father. And we can look at each other and say, brother and sister. And he has grabbed us into his family. And some of you are foster parents. Some of you are adoptive parents. And you know what that process is like. And God did that for each of you as well. And you are now part of the family. And you get to experience all the benefits of belonging to God. And God in his love says, hey, with me comes a huge inheritance. Your eternity is secure. We will be together forever. We just need to sit in that. So here's our takeaway just for this week. It's be honest. Two things. One is be honest about your resentment. In other words, don't hide anymore. If there is someone that you're resentful towards, there's no reason to hide anymore because God wants to do something with it. Jesus got angry with the religious leaders of his day because they were hypocrites. What they would do, he says, you guys clean the outside of your cup, but inside you are full of envy and strife. He says, if you want to be, be pure, take what is inside and put it outside. In other words, don't try to hide what's going on in the inside. If there is deep pain, if there's deep resentment, Jesus says, be honest. It's the first step to forgiveness. So my challenge for us this week and today is first to begin to be honest with our resentment. And the second of be honest is be honest about what God has done for you this week. My prayer is that you will just sit and enjoy all that God has done for you and experience that freedom that God has given in your relationship with him. If you're in a small group and you're going through this relationship series, the questions this week will be focusing on that, just enjoying God. So my prayer for you this week and for all of us is can we just savor and enjoy and love what God has done for us. Does that sound good? Amen? Amen. Now, um, in my research this week, I came across this, which I thought was fascinating. Researchers from a university in the Netherlands asked people to write down, write about a time when they either gave 
or withheld forgiveness. So they got a group of people together and they asked them to write either a time, some, some of them wrote a time where they gave forgiveness and another half of them wrote a time where they withheld forgiveness. Then they asked these people to jump as high as they could five times without bending their knees. The forgivers jumped highest about 11.8 inches on average, while the grudge holders jumped eight and a half inches. A huge difference and a starting illustration of how forgiveness can actually unburden you. I want us to jump, amen? amen. I want us to be jumpers. I want us to be free of the shackles that we have on our shoulders because of unforgiveness. And God wants the same for you. God realizes that our unre- unforgiveness, our grudge holding, hurts us more than anyone. And so not only in response to what he's done for you, but for your own well-being, God would want us to jump high and jump free. So my challenge for you today is to be honest. Be honest about the resentment, but be honest about what God has done for you. Savor that this, this week. And next week, we'll take that. We'll take what God has done for us and translate it into how do we actually forgive one another? Pray with me. God, we just want to stop right now and say thank you for all that you have done for us. And Lord, there are some of us here who just need to be reminded of that. And there are some of you here who perhaps have never opened yourselves up to the forgiveness that God wants to give you through Jesus Christ. And so I pray for all of us, God, that we would be in awe again and renewed again by the forgiveness you've granted us. And I pray as we enjoy that this week and savor that this week, it will make, us, make it easier for us to forgive those who have harmed us. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.